Welcome to the Legally Speaking Podcast. I'm your host, Rob Hanna. This week, I'm delighted to be joined by the wonderful Yulia Barnes. Yulia is the proud founder and managing partner of Barnes Law, a boutique commercial law firm in Mayfair, London. Yulia first qualified as a lawyer in Russia before qualifying in England and Wales. She has an impressive career trajectory with experience as a general counsel at Global Corporate Ventures, lawyer at Clyde & Co, and partner at Tassel Solicitors, heading their dispute resolution department. Yulia also spent time in-house before founding Barnes Law in 2019. She specializes in commercial law, corporate law, dispute resolution, corporate governments for commercial clients, as well as high net worth individuals. At Barnes Law, Yulia is dedicated to bringing a personal touch to every case, being recognized as a leading professional in her field. So a very big warm welcome, Yulia. Hey Rob, good to be here. Ah, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Before we dive into all your amazing projects and experiences to date, we do have a customary icebreaker question here on the Legally Speaking podcast, which is, on the scale of 1 to 10, 10 being very real, what would you rate the hit TV series Suits in terms of its reality of the law if you've seen it? Well, since I can't say zero, I'd say one. It's, it's <laughs> not very real at all. And, and with that, you give a very concise answer. We're going to move swiftly on to talk all about you. So obviously, I gave a very high level introduction there of your impressive journey. But would you mind taking our listeners back and telling us a bit more detail about your background and career journey? Sure. Um, since very young age, I wanted to be a lawyer. And I, uh, did, after graduating from school, I went straight to uni. So I've graduated from my first law degree. Um, had some experience working in-house while studying uh, in England to um, become a lawyer here. Um, and um, ever since I graduated, I have been uh, in various law firms that you've mentioned. Um, so before I started uh, being a contentious lawyer, I really enjoyed um, getting into corporate structures, uh, looking at mergers and acquisitions. And then, so it happens, my first job at Clyde & Co uh, turned to be in the arbitration department and I've discovered an exciting world of litigation and I enjoy it ever since. And the rest is history, as they say. So let's talk about the entrepreneurial side of things as well, because what you've done with Barnes Law is very impressive. Um, talk us through that journey to setting up Barnes Law and tell us more about what Barnes Law specializes in. So Barnes Law uh, is a commercial boutique. Um, since I have been working with businesses from day one, I've discovered that perhaps there is a big gap between um, lawyers and business owners, which shouldn't be like that, because uh, as a profession, we are there to, to provide support, to maximize growth, to make it secure, to guide, but inevitably business owners will make their own decision and sometimes they're wrong and sometimes they're right, but um, they, are, they have different risk appetites to, to what we have because we're all about making it secure and making it um, sort of certain for people. So I've decided to uh, set up this boutique so we can actually partner with businesses and we can be almost their outsourced legal department. So we are more, much more closer to, to the management, to, to the owners, and we understand the structure, we understand the drivers of the business, we, we, um, we look at their long-term plans, we look at their, the way they're structured internally. So some, some departments, for example, um, sort of um, much more uh, cautious with the way they talk to clients to sell their products, the way they they represent their product, shall we say, and the promises they make, and some people are not. So we we get in, we assess that, we talk to managers, we understand what type of contract they would require, for example. Um, would we need to be more careful? Would we need to hold their hand? Would they even read their contract? Because most people trust their lawyers and they say, well, I paid for it, so I trust that you've, you've provided for my interest and it's all going to be fine, which is so far from reality. Um, so I've decided that uh, that concept works really well and it's much more enjoyable uh, to work with businesses in that way. 
Yeah, and I have to say, what what you have achieved is uh, incredible. And I tip my hat to anybody who who takes that brave step to setting up their own firm. Um, let's talk more about at the high level then of managing partner. You know, what do some of your responsibilities involve there, and what does a typical day look like for you? I'm sure it's no two days are the same. Uh, absolutely. Uh, uh, you, you obviously you wake up to uh, a, a lot of messages and calls because business owners. Uh, tend to wake up really early they have their workout at 6 a.m and then by the time you you have your first coffee you already know that um, they they either chased you or they want uh, an update or they want to discuss something because business life um, happens really quickly and most of the decisions need to be taken yesterday and when they come to you with a project um, the expectation is something happens within one or two days so um, there's a lot of pressure from that point of view because you you have to uh, make sure that it's safe you may you have to make sure that you've thought about it you've considered carefully all the risks but at the same time you obviously um, meet the expectations uh, for the fast pace that most businesses have um, and of course we have the wonderful world of compliance nowadays which is uh, <laughs> it's really tough so it's not my favorite question uh, subject but uh, we we have to do that so there will be a lot of management and supervision on that side and of course uh, there are the team meetings that uh, you have to make sure that um, everyone knows what is happening in the firm you you also have to be informed of what's happening on each case so um, it, it has to be well structured for any business um, or managing partner to, to be able to achieve the goals you have to have a really good structure but at the same time things happen not quite to your plan yeah, you can expect the unexpected, I guess, some days you can have the, the best plan and structure. But I guess when certain things come in, you know, there's a crisis management mode, you, you have to act on things. But I think you gave a really good solid over there of overview there of what you, you get up to. And um, look, it's not easy running a business. It's not easy necessarily being a lawyer and dealing with, like you say, you've got clients that are up at the crack of door and they're probably demanding, they're needing your help. Um, you know, most people come to lawyers because they've got a pain. There's a pain point of some description that they're trying to overcome. So what have been some of your challenges you've experienced founding Barnes Law and how have you managed to overcome them? What words of advice would you give to others who might be experiencing challenges now running their own firm? Well, I think as lawyers, uh, we are not taught how to run a business. Um, so certainly, I would I would think that b before you think of establishing a law firm, you probably need to learn how the business actually works. Because if you have good structure in place, um, you probably will be ahead of, of the rest, or at least you'll be able to comply with your business plan, which quite often is much more ambitious than you're able to achieve at times um so yeah i think the challenges are i guess it's having the right funding in place having good consultants that can set things up for you uh opening bank accounts i mean l luckily i said it a lot before COVID, and we didn't have many delays and it was much much easier but now i i see how businesses struggle to even open a bank account it takes forever sometimes um so yeah, I think the challenge is, you know, when you don't have a big team, you almost do everything yourself, uh, unless you have big budgets uh, to uh, bring in people straight away. Um, so I think the first couple of years is you work weekends and, you know, most nights to, to achieve what you need to achieve. Yeah, and I, I remember back to, you know, I, I my, my, my company, recruitment company has just turned eight years old. And I think back to years one, two and three, you know, where I was having to put in the hours, you know, nobody knew who I was, I needed to be established and, and needed to get the work done. Um, but of course, within within reason, you know, you've got to make sure that you're also looking after yourself in, in the same breath. So you avoid that sort of burnout scenario and having good mentors and people around you to guide you along the way is, is, is important. And I found that. But what would be, you know, the number one thing you'd wish you'd known before setting up your law firm that would have saved you so many headaches that you've experienced to date? Um, I think you have to be brave. Well, you have to be brave to set on your own, given the risks and responsibilities that any lawyer has. Um, but I would think that start employing people much earlier. Don't 
think, oh, can I afford a salary or not? Um, you probably will be able to, but you can't do it all yourself. So don't be afraid to start employing people as early as possible. Yeah, and I remember a, a mentor said to me many years ago, he, he, you adapt to the environment. So if you buy a big house and you've been in a flat, you'll still find a way to fill that big house with furniture and things. Similarly with your company, right? Or your firm. You know, if you if you can get into that office space and there's some empty desks, the reality is you can make that happen. So you want to keep continually growing and having that, that growth mindset. And that really stuck with me. But look, you've worked in a number of different environments, um, international, large international firms, in-house. You know, what what advantages do you see in the boutique approach, especially when it comes to serving clients in Mayfair? Well, I think um, we probably are quite suitable for medium-sized businesses, for startups, because um, you know we we can work with different budgets, and um, it's much easier to contact us and have a more personal approach. Um, you know, we uh, use, for example, we use messengers for, you know, initial chats, um, which a lot of young business owners find very easy because that's all they're used to. Uh, so what they say is you're, you are a WhatsApp message away. Um, so and, um, and because it's, it's young and vibrant, we attract a lot of uh, young people to, to join who are joining Barnes Law. So um, I think that it also has this young vibe. Um, but yeah, I think boutique is, is, is more sort of bespoke approach and more personal approach to clients. So we know who they are, what they do, their characters, their hobbies. Um, so we know what style to adopt working with them. And, and the word that I always come to talk about is caring. I think, you know, if you can really channel in on those little touches, knowing that so-and-so's daughter maybe supports a football team and you could maybe then suggest tickets to an event for them or something that's coming up, really having that level of relationship that makes them not feel like they're in a number dealing with just a, a large corporate. I think that really is the heart of what we're, we're, we're driving to. And again, I talk about this on every, recruit, um, every recording we've had, I think in the last year or two, it's no longer B2B or b 2 C, it's H to H, it's that human to human connection that's going to win the business now and moving forwards even more so in this sort of tech enabled world we're in. So I really like that sort of personal touch. So let's talk about leadership because as a managing partner, how do you define good leadership and what role does it play in fostering a positive culture, particularly within your law firm? Um, it's interesting. I think lead by example. Um, I I have tried different trainings and programs or executive programs on leadership, and inevitably, I think that if your team respects you, um, that's your answer. You you have to be as hardworking. You you need to be knowledgeable. You need to be interesting. You need to be inspiring, and you need to share that knowledge with them. So if they see that it's not just a job, but you genuinely care and you genuinely invest your time in them, and you you correct some mistakes or some misunderstanding, but you then explain why, and then you even sometimes just say, "Well, what about this strategy?" Uh, which isn't really something that I, I found many managers do because you you know you don't have that much time. But for me, I, I like my team to stay with me long term. So I really like them to give the best what I have and what I've learned from amazing managers I worked with. Um, and I think they appreciate it. Well, I hope they do. Uh, and, you know, and sometimes you see your team copying something that you've done before and you see, well, well, they, they obviously... Um, they obviously respect uh, your knowledge and they, they feel that they want to learn from it. So they, they copy in some patterns, which I think is, is probably a sign that it's working. Yeah, absolutely. And it's definitely working for you. Let's try and break that down then for our listeners to understand at a more granular level. What leadership traits do you believe are most important when managing a law firm? Well, I think you have to have good structure. Um, you have to also have a, a human side. So your colleagues need to feel that they can have a conversation with you and they can have a frank conversation with you and that whenever they have a question, uh, they're not afraid to ask it. And um, I think that that's what it matters. It's not about being strict or not strict. It's It's not. It's just having this great relationship of, um, of confidence and respect. I think that's what leadership is about. 
Yeah, I, I, I agree. Those those two definitely go hand in hand. And I always say, you know, respect is, is, is earned. And, you know, I think people shouldn't take that for granted as well to, to stay respected because environments change, markets change, and sort of you need, continually need to be making sure your leadership is fit for purpose because leaders many, many years ago versus modern leaders with all the tools and the variances of market dynamics and things that have happened, you've got to be a sort of modern leader in, in my view. Um, let's talk about getting deeper into the, the sort of professional and personal touch side of things. I think it's so important um, to, to get right. And I think it's how law firms can really differentiate themselves, particularly in 2024. So balancing professionalism with a personal touch is ultimately crucial, isn't it, in terms of those relationships. Can you share any examples of how you achieve this balance to ensure client success? Um well it's um i think it's intuitive you you get it with experience uh so most most clients that we deal with are professional clients anyway and they 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 have they have that boundary they understand you know where you know you 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 can mix the uh the professional side with the personal side, but you don't sort of, they don't take advantage of the fact that, you know, you're always available, you're always there. So there's that respect. Um, so I think it's just, uh, it's intuitive and uh, it comes with experience. And I, I don't think it's something that you can teach. Yeah, I, and I remember my late grandfather saying, you know, you can't put a wise head on young shoulders. I know, I think there's, there's times are changing, but there's some truth behind some, some of that. I mean, in terms of your... Um, understanding of business needs, I think that's really what sets you, you you apart and you're really kind of focused in on, on really understanding that so you can deliver the best results for your clients. But how do you and your team go about gaining that understanding of each individual client's unique business challenges and objectives? I think it's a thorough questioning. Uh, whenever a client calls uh, and, for example, says, I need this contract, I never say, okay, fine. I actually question what is what is the reason for this contract? What do you do? I mean, how would you, for example, you know, I give you this contract, what are you going to do with this? What, what, because often sometimes, I mean, not, not, not often, but sometimes clients come and they ask for something, but they need something else. So it's about taking time to, to question what is the purpose behind it um, and actually what is not what because sometimes people confuse process and and the aim so you you just want to say where where you're getting with it uh, and then we can explain to you the process how you get there i love that and yeah it always comes down in any industry in my opinion the better quality questions you ask the better quality information you will receive and the better service you can then deliver. So let's talk about the ever changing legal landscape then, um, because we are in a very, very fast moving world. So business needs are changing regularly. How does Barnes Law adapt its approach to very much remaining agile and responsive to the changing needs of your clients? Again, it's just keeping keeping track of, of all the changes that is ha that, that happen in, in legislation. Uh, and quite often we would even approach clients ourselves to say, well, look, this is changing. We've done this for you before. I think you need a review because we need to change something about it. Um, uh, also, just understanding not just what's happening in the business, uh, all the trends, and there's a lot of training around for lawyers. Uh, you can probably go to training every day and never hear the same stuff. So, it, yeah, we we take that quite seriously, and everyone has a particular plan, um, how many hours they have to do each month, so we have it recorded, or and so we have reviews, and then I'll look at their training plans, and I see if they have done enough or not. But there, there's plenty around to, to be on top of things. Yeah, never, never a shortage. Today's episode of the Legally Speaking podcast is brought to you by our wonderful sponsor, Clio, the leader in cloud-based legal technology, transforming how law firms operate. If you're a solicitor or managing a law firm, you know how crucial efficiency is. That's where Clio comes in. Clio's comprehensive cloud-based software streamlines your entire practice from client onboarding to case management, billing, and payments. With Clio, you can access your files securely from anywhere, collaborate with your team in real time, and manage your calendar seamlessly. No more missed deadlines, no more lost documents, and a billing process that's as easy as clicking a button. 
By moving to the cloud with Clio, other law firms have reported 20 plus additional billable hours per month and a 50% boost in revenue. That's more time to focus on what truly matters, serving your clients and growing your practice. Join the over 150,000 legal professionals who trust Clio to make their firms more efficient and productive. Ready to transform your practice? Visit clio.com forward slash UK to learn more and start your free trial today. Now back to the show. Okay, let's switch lanes and talk a bit about dispute resolution then. And again, we have a whole range of listeners listening. So for those who might be less familiar, can you tell us what dispute resolution is firstly? And then also sort of how do you see dispute resolution potentially changing or evolving um, moving forwards? So dispute resolution is when a dispute arises between companies or individuals and um, they can't resolve that dispute between themselves and then they have to resort to lawyers to to settle their differences. So um, it's quite a wide term. So it can include uh, negotiations in, uh, in in correspondence. It can dispute. It can involve mediation where you get a third party involved to to actually spend a day or so with you uh, trying to resolve the differences, which is actually quite effective because at the end of the day, it's almost like a preview of what can happen in court because there's a lot of pressure, people are in different rooms, there's this independent person travels and uh, between the rooms and you know tells the other party's position and then they have to think about you know how to respond to it. So it is... It's quite stressful, and I think um, at the end of the day, when everybody either gets tired or sees that actually maybe they don't have that strong position, and they're better off uh, settling because um, at that point you have control over what you can do. As soon as you go to court, if you can't settle, you go to court. Um, you give that control to third party. So essentially, uh, we can do our best to persuade that you have a strong position, but it's going to be somebody else that is going to decide and we don't know how it's going to turn out. Or well, at least we can't give any guarantees. So that's that's kind of a short description of what dispute resolution is. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I think you gave a very good comprehensive overview, actually. And I, I think you make a good point about you can only control the controllables, you know, so you need to do what best you can in terms of controlling what you can ultimately control to then hopefully try and ensure that things that might be out of your control go the way that you want to, particularly for your, yourself as, as the lawyer and, of course, the, the client. So how does your approach then differ um, navigating litigation for, say, UK businesses, startups and multinational corporations? So we start off with uh, analyzing uh, what we can potentially achieve out of it, because I always tell to people, and a lot of people come angry because you obviously go through different stages of, you know, you're upset, then you accept it, then, you know, you get tired of it, and then you say, well, actually, just just end it. It's too expensive. It's too long. I, I don't want to be involved anymore. So you start off by saying, okay, well, what are we trying to achieve? Um, so it's not about going to court and winning. It's about money at the end of the day most of the time so um i said well we can do all of that for example but let's see if the other side has any assets because you might be successful in court so you have a bit of paper showing that you've done really well but the, at the end of it is this going to result in you getting the money out of that person or getting an outcome of whatever you expect you know yes or no and a lot of people think okay well then Fine, so there's a risk. Let's then establish what 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 are the assets on the other side because you can spend uh, you know a millions litigating and the end of it you're going to be out of pocket. Um, so we start from there, and then uh, if we, for example, can establish that there are assets and it's worth pursuing, we we also look at the contract, how strong the position is, um, what are the likelihoods of you losing or winning. And then based on that assessment, the, the client takes a decision. But in reality, I always say that if you want to have control and settle it as quickly as possible, 
and you can never recover 100% of your costs anyway so you you will always spend uh, a bit more than you can get back can get back or much more than you can get back uh, in some regimes because it just depends on um, which truck you are in uh, it's better that you take a pragmatic approach because all the time you're litigating your attention is off doing other things so you might be losing not just you know in legal fees or potentially in, in you know losing the case but you're also losing out on investing you know, improving your business growing your business so because your focus is somewhere else so that is all need, that needs to be considered when you decide to go to court yeah everything is energy and if, if things are taking energy from you um that isn't like you say allowing you to really focus on your goals of running and driving your business and servicing your own clients then you need to look at the opportunity cost of that as as well um okay let's talk about um some of the common pitfalls startups encounter when entering into contracts or engaging in business transactions what would you say to that for startups it's difficult because uh some startups well, most startups don't have budgets and they're very excited about what they're about to do. Um, so they focused on um, obviously driving the idea off the ground, um, investing in their project, product, whatever they're developing. Um, so quite often they either don't have documents in place or they get documents from somebody that did something that don't fit exactly the model that that they have or they download them from some e-libraries online um, sometimes they are the appropriate contracts for that particular scenario and sometimes it's something else that even not even relevant um, and unfortunately you know you sometimes can continue grow um, I mean often if you intending to have rounds of investment you on the first round you you establish that you probably don't have it because investors would want to see the health of your business uh including legal health of your business and they will see you know into the structure or who you have as your uh, co-owners of the business do you have a deadlock company that has a potential of you know having lots of issues when two owners can't agree and you have no mechanism of resolving how you're going to deal with it um and uh, or sometimes they go on for ages and we have experiences with clients that would trade for many many years and then conflict arises and they discover that they don't have anything to help them to resolve the issue and a lot of people don't know that deadlock company that deadlock companies on valuation get a reduction on the value because it's it's a 50 50 company uh, or whatever that log is and um, so unfortunately you can discover issues quite late on uh, which can be uh, cause a lot of damage to your company and potential loss of your business so you can't really not uh, appreciate the the importance of having the right documents in place and as as someone who's um invested in companies sits on the board of companies started up companies that is some of the most important advice you you will hear um particularly on deadlock clauses and indeed what's in reserved matters and if this stuff really isn't landing with you you really need to go away and make sure that you have a comprehensive understanding of what the documents say within your business because if you're trying to remove shareholders, if you're trying to do things in terms of growth, whatever it might be, what the, what is in the contract is in the contract. So you need to understand that. And like you say, also from a health perspective and also from sort of perspective people. So I think that's a really, really important point you, you mentioned there. So thank you for sharing that and giving some really good um, examples. Let's switch now to talk about property. So could you explain a little bit in terms of the difference between commercial and residential property firstly? Well, commercial property is commercial premise. So it's a restaurant or a shop uh, and residential property is where it's, it's where you live. So it's a, it's, it's a house or a flat uh, intended for a human habitation. And, and it's as simple as that, folks. So sometimes we don't need to overcomplicate things on the show. Let's talk about a recent article, um, Barnes Law article, Navigating the Building Safety Act 2022. It states the legislation is aimed at enhancing building safety, establishing rigorous standards and procedures for the construction and management of buildings. So what are the implications of the Safety Act? 
So for, for us, we have been looking, of course, we, we, we're doing a residential convincing. So it's important for us to, whenever we buy, um, to have the right documents in place to uh, make sure that the building is safe. Um, and um, But f we also looked at this from a construction comp company's point of view, because some of them are our clients. Um, and in terms of liabilities that... Um, and I, I'm not going to talk about fairness or unfairness, but um, you know, so, some of that liability is for something that was completely compliant and legal when it was built, but because of the uh, fires, they have changed the regulation, uh, which is much tighter, but somehow those construction companies will be responsible if that building is not compliant. So there are lots of grants around where can construction companies um, you know, can, can get to fix their things, but we have instances where people get uh, pre-action letters saying well you, you you completed a building but it wasn't it's not compliant and unfortunately it's not just uh, the company that did the construction project it can be a company that is in the same uh, group structure which you know is is quite harsh but nonetheless um, yeah it has a lot of uh, implications for construction companies that did the projects in the past yeah, no, absolutely. And again, really important point. So I appreciate you giving some some detail around that. Let's talk a little bit about technology, because as it continues to transform the business landscape, what role do you see AI and technology playing in potentially the litigation process? Um, it's interesting because um, a lot of people think that it's the future and it might replace lawyers. I'm a bit skeptical about this, um, at least at this point of time, we have some technology um, and even Clio has, is using some technology and we, because we, we're using Clio as our case management system, um, which sort of helps with some admin tasks. So automation is, is great, but in terms of using uh, technology to create documents or letters, uh, we've tried to play with it just out of interest to see um, how how good it is. I, I didn't find it, well, I mean, unless you know exactly how to ask, uh, ask the question, you're not going to get the right outcome because it's all about... Um, analyzing exactly what is required and then finding the right precedent, finding the right lesser approach to it. So, and I think that's the key when clients come, they need help with that um, because not everybody knows. I mean, unless you are trained as a lawyer, why would you know? Um, so it's, it's, yeah, if you, if you don't ask the correct question, then you're not going to get the right outcome. And also, uh, sometimes it gives you, even if you know how to, what to ask, sometimes it gives you a really strange result. And we know, all know about uh, cases where uh, the program came up with fake case law. And uh, I think we have this in American negligent cases where, you know, they argued using wrong precedents that just not even wrong, but they didn't exist uh, to argue something. And obviously they were found out. And um, so I don't think it's ready. It's, it probably will be. Uh, it might replace some junior positions where you can automate things. But in terms of creating a structure and something that a human being can, can do, um, so I think much senior level would not be impacted. Yeah, no. And again, thank you for giving such great examples and, and your sort of perspective on that as a, as a leader who's working in this space, particularly with that sort of boutique law firm model. Looking forwards then, in terms of the next few years, what developments do you anticipate shaping the, the legal sector and, and how does Barnes Law plan to adapt to these potential changes? Um, we always looking out for technologists. We uh, and there are a few publications or training or events organized in London um, where uh, companies present their products. So we have in practical law, for example, using some tools integrating so there are very soft 
software packages that you can buy as an add-on to help you with some contract management, um, some automation of your drafting. So um, it, it's difficult to say because it's it's moving so so fast. Um, but we're definitely if there is a product out there that will be useful, we'd definitely be looking into it. Yeah, no, and it's great that you kind of stay curious, you stay open minded and, you know, embrace technology. I think that's a really good message to send as a as a leader. And um, this has been a masterclass, as I knew it was going to be, Yula, in terms of sharing all your wisdom from how you've got to from where you started to where you are today with Barnes Law. It's, it's thoroughly impressive. And I'm sure a lot of people can get a lot of value from today. But finally, what would be your one piece of advice for aspiring lawyers looking to specialize in either commercial or corporate law? Um. I would I would say you have to get as much experience as possible and I would like to say that um, it's quite important um, to start in the right environment so uh, you just need to understand if you want to work in a boutique you want to work in a big farm uh, you want to work in house so it's okay to try uh, maybe try all um, and then set up your mind because um, once you find your right environment, um, it, it's going to be very enjoyable. Um, and also when you find the right partners managers, it's also going to be very enjoyable because it's an amazing profession to be in. Um, uh, it, it is challenging, but at the same time, it's so, so enjoyable. So when you find the right place and the right partners, senior people who will help you to grow, uh, it's going to be very enjoyable. Yeah, no, really well said. I think it's um, it's people, isn't it? You know, if you can get around the right people that can shape your career, can support you during the tough and the good times, then, you know, you're really off to the races. But I think that's some really sound advice. Um, if our listeners, which I'm sure they will, Yulia, want to know more um, about your career or Barnes Law, where can they go to find out more? What's the best social media handles and websites for them to go and visit? So we have our Barnes Law um, site that has uh, some details about what we do. We also publish our events uh, where, for example, I'm, I'm speaking or I'm attending a, a arbitration days. Um, we also publish our articles on LinkedIn and things that exciting things that we do, but also there are contact details for us. We are quite open to discussions and a lot of people that work with us actually just drop me a line and and it was quite an unusual introduction, which I found really exciting. So um, two of those people are now have jobs with us. So uh, obviously do not hesitate. Absolutely. You never know where a message may lead. Yeah, and I love that. And you obviously you've got some exciting events coming up. And yeah, I would encourage people. We've also had the London International Disputes Weeks team come on and check out what they're getting up to generally in terms of disputes events. But Yulia, this has been absolutely amazing. Thank you so, so much for, for coming on to the, the Legally Speaking podcast. I've really enjoyed, enjoyed it. Wishing you lots of continued success with your career and Barnes Law. But from now, from all of us on the show, over and out. Thank you for listening to this week's episode. If you like the content here, why why not check out our world leading content and collaboration hub, the Legally Speaking Club over on Discord. Go to our website, www.legallyspeakingpodcast.com for the link to join our community there. Over and out.